rearranging. All right, oh, wait, hold on. I know how to use Zoom, y'all. Okay, so the two films that I'm gonna be talking about are Candyman and uh, Get Out. Um, I'll be following this layout for the discussion of Candyman basically because it provides context for both films. And then we'll get into the specifics of each film. Um, so I'll be talking about anti-Black propaganda in the US, racist ideologies and interracial relationships in the UK. Um, that's when I'll throw it back over to Sam and they'll talk about them. So you can see that this isn't just something that was um, in the US. Uh, then contemporary politics and white uh, saviors and white saviorship as it comes up in Candyman. And then of course, Be My Victim, Love and Monstrosity, talking about um, the depiction of monsters, monsters and love in Candyman. So I'm gonna start with some history. Um, if you might already be familiar with it, but uh, you need the context in order to fully understand some of the problematic elements. So, all right, I'm gonna talk about the road to Jim Crow. Uh, if you are not familiar with Jim Crow, Jim Crow were laws um, that were at the state and the local level that enforced racial segregation in the Southern United States following the Civil War. I using, I'm using the term antebellum America here um, to basically, I know we normally use it as the antebellum South, but the um, anti-Black propaganda uh, that, and stereotypes of Jim Crow didn't stay in the South. They ultimately influenced the entire United States and I would even say outside of uh, the borders of the country. So, this map that you're seeing is from the 1860 census. The 1860 census was the last census that was taken prior to the Civil War starting in 1861 to when it ended in 1865. Um, it's considered one of the most accurate censuses of this time because since the world was falling, well, not the world, excuse me, since the US was falling into the Civil War, they were really determined to get the information about the people and the population. Um, so the population of the United States at the time was approximately 31.4 uh, million free people. And this means um, black Americans who were either born free or who won their freedom at the time, uh, 476,000. And then it should be noted that the population, that 31 um, million number does not include the slave population of 4 million, which was a total 13% of the population or include any Native Americans who either lived on reservations or what the government at the time uh, chose to call unclaimed land, which was their land anyway, but that's another conversation. Um, so you can get a better idea of how uh, slavery was practiced throughout the United States. This 1860 census map is showing uh, the locations of slavery and the percentage of slaves in them. So if you start at this third sort of gray area, that's 30%, 40%, 50%, all the way up to 80 or more percent of the population of that area um, is slaves. So this 4 million population, while it was definitely uh, particularly heavy in some areas, it was throughout this entire area. Um, so now everybody, we, we talk about the civil civil war and it's not this thing that just happened um, overnight. It was something that was worked towards for a long time. Um, most people are familiar with Harriet Tubman. She was an ab ab abolitionist um, and ex-slave and uh, led people through the Underground Railroad. If you weren't familiar with her, she just had a film come out, questionable film, but it, you know, just like Bell, it gives you some historical context. Um, Sojourner Truth also was a slave and ultimately became an abolitionist, and then Nat Turner. So Nat Turner is pre predominantly known because he organized a rebellion um, that was comprised of Virginian slaves, and it was not the Nat Turner Rebellion of 1831. It ultimately ended with him being killed, but it made people more aware of slavery and how that people were willing to fight for it, and it also inspired um, abolitionists to start organizing. 
So William Lord Garrison, Elijah and Elijah Paris Lovejoy are, were two of the founding members of the American Anti-Slavery Society that was founded in 1880, 1883. Um, I, I was said that and that is not what I would say, I apologize. 1838, I inverted my numbers, um, following the Nat Turner Rebellion. Um, Elijah Paris Lovejoy was actually ultimately killed by a pro-slavery mob. Um, and he also worked with David Walker, who was also alive um, up to the time of Nat Turner. So all of these people were actively working to end slavery, most of them working from the, uh, the more northern states that still had slavery, but uh, a lot of them had a process where you could work towards your, your freedom incrementally. Um, so there was more, they were more able to have abolitionist movements. Um, in that area of the United States. So they're doing all this work, but then along comes uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe. Um, in 1852, she published Uncle Tom's Cabin, also known as Life Among the Lowly, in response to the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act. The 1850 Fugitive Slave Act, ultimately, it required people in Northern states that I, if, that didn't have slavery, that if a slave from the South ended up there, you were required, and this was by the federal government, um, to return that slave to the South and to their owner. Harriet Beecher Stowe was part of an abolitionist movement and she thought that it was heinous to require people to be part of the um, institutional of slavery if they didn't want to. And so she wrote this highly fictionalized account of um, a slave's journey and ultimately the people he comes in contact with. So while this sounds like it might have been a great thing and in some ways uh, it was because it this book was ridiculously popular. Uh, it started being as being published in abolitionist periodicals. It was um, over 40 um, weeks and then it was so popular the publisher came to her and was like, Harriet, we love it. I couldn't stop reading it. Um, I cried when one of the characters died. Everybody needs to read this. So she got a publishing deal. Um, in the first year, there are 300,000 copies just in the U.S. alone. A couple of years later, there are approximately 1.5 million copies in the U.K. That's not accounting for all of the illegal copies because um, that was a very standard thing at the time because there wasn't copyright between the two uh, nations. Um, in time, this became the second most book sold in the United States after the Bible. It was a part of the culture. Um, everybody read it. Everybody knew about it. There were plays about it. There were musicals about it. There were traveling shows about it. Um, it was a, it was an everyday part of the culture. So now this would be great if you're saying, yay, like, like pro-abolitionist narrative being out seeing the suffering of slaves except Harriet Beecher Stowe wasn't actually on the forefront of abolition. So this highly fictionalized count, um, one, it's actually third person interpretation of abolitionists who are actually speaking to slaves. Um, and also it fails to humanize black people. Rather, it takes on the approach that the horrors of slavery can be fixed through Christianity. And each of the characters is very much a stereotype that you'll probably recognize that we see today and that I, we might have already even mentioned when we were discussing um, Bridgerton. So the titular Uncle Tom, he is the um, black noble hero who's Christ-like in forgiveness. So he's held up as what a good person and their for a good slave should be. Um, he has several violent uh, slave masters in the story. And please note that this is after he's sold by his benevolent slave masters. Um, and they beat him and they don't treat him well, but at, in the end, he forgives them all because he's Christ-like in his heart. Um, this is where the noble hero um, idea comes from on top of the fact that he also, while he is a slave, befriends a young a young blonde white girl 
who when she sees how uh, noble Uncle Tom is, because after he's sold, he's on a boat and somebody falls in and he saves them, she asks her father if they can buy Uncle Tom because he's such a good person. And then they subsequently form a relationship over their mutual love of Christ, um, which, excuse my tone when I, I talk about it. Um, so the other stereotype that this perpetuates is the happy darky. This is usually um, a male character who is lazy and carefree. They are content to be the slave on the plantation or if they're not on the plantation, they're content to do nothing. And note that the happy darky, the fact that this person is darker, darker skin tone plays into this stereotype as being more ape-like and therefore less intelligent. Um, the other stereotype is the tragic light skin um, sex object mulatto. There are several female slaves who are sex objects and who are sex slaves in the Uncle Tom's uh, cabin narrative. And they have to be saved not only for their souls, but also for because their bodies have been abused. Um, once again, if you're thinking about a character in Bridgeton, you are correct. Um, there's also the affectionate dark-skinned Mammy. If you're familiar with Aunt Jemima, no, uh, while she is no longer the uh, mascot of the pancake mix, and I think flour, depending on which country you're in, um, this is actually where that Mammy stereotype started. Not to say that um, it didn't exist before, but this is where it was sort of um, fully uh, fleshed out and defined and became part of the general conscious of the public. Um, Mammy was usually like a little bit overweight, um, darker skinned, once again, showing the um, importance of that colorism aspect that she is darker skinned and always taking care of the white children and very sweet to them, you know, love, love them like they were her own. Um, which in the context of slavery, loving other children like you're, they're your own when your own can be sold away is a statement in and of itself. Um, there's also a young black child and uh, she's shown as unintelligent and mischievous. Not only does she not speak clearly, but there's also the uh, suggestion that because she, because, that she's either emotionally or mentally or, or physically um, unstable. So there's that touch of ableism right there. But then on top of that, um, She's still mischievous. She still steals stuff. She still plays with her mistress's stuff uh, when she shouldn't. So even though there's a suggestion that she's not fully aware, it's still her fault. Um, and then finally, we have the angelic white savior, who is the blonde little girl who befriends um, the noble hero, Uncle Tom. And all of the slaves who are around her, uh, she gets sick. And in the end, she dies. But before she dies, she goes around and gives locks of her golden hair to all the slaves and has them has them promise to be Christ-like and to be good people and then has her father promise to release them. And once again, this was furthering uh, Stowe's narrative that through Christianity, all the ills of slavery can be forgiven, also taking away the agency that maybe the slaves don't want to forgive anybody. Um, but because this white girl gave them their hair, she will. And I don't know if you can see it in the picture, but the imagery also really drives from the fact, if you see the character Uncle Tom, um, this is Uncle Tom and he's sitting right next to Ava, that's the name of the little white girl. And there's a halo behind his head, um, suggesting sort of like, because he's so quite nice, he's one of the good ones. Um, and I don't know if you can also see sort of the exaggerated features as well. And this becomes something that's a standard part of uh, Black stereotypes. So we have all these stereotypes out, everybody's talking about them. And this, these stereotypes, the novel that they're in is said to be the thing that helps promote um, the Civil War. There's the story that when um, President Abe Lincoln met Harriet Beecher Stowe, he was like, oh, so you're the respon you're the one who's responsible for this war. Now, obviously, that's BS. I showed you a few pictures of the people who are actively fighting um, for abolition, but pop culture had power even back in the 1800s, and so she was seen as the person who sparked 
um, the, the national sentiment of uh, abolition. So following the Civil War um, that went from 1861 to 1865, we have Reconstruction and Reconstruction ultimately leads to Jim Crow. So Reconstruction was the area following the Civil War that ultimately was supposed to um, not only help slaves transition to freedmen, but also heal the heal the ills between the North and the South that had happened um, and cause the United States to become one, one country again. Uh, the picture that you're seeing is a very idealized um, uh, depiction of the Freedmen's Bureau that's an officer of the Freedmen's Bureau uh, standing between the angry white mob and the newly um, free uh, black men. And the Freedmen's Bureau ultimately, in not only were they supposed to help slave transition into free life, but they were also supposed to be protecting them, which we all know how well that went because none of us have ever heard of the KKK, so it did really well. I apologize for my sarcasm, but I, this picture is so ridiculous. And it was one that was widely circulated. Once again, the power of propaganda to say like, look at what the government is doing. Like we're doing something that's better for everybody. We're gonna stop more fighting because the South had been destroyed. A lot of people had lost what they had. And the, I mean, everybody, I feel like we're always talking about now the number of people who died in the Civil War. Um, and so this was like, no, we can have peace. The Freedmen's Bureau is here to provide it. So I previously showed you the 1860 census and there's not another census prior to the Civil War. But one thing that's under important to understand about it um, in the context of Jim Crow is that the slave population of 4 million was now free. Um, so one thing that the Freedmen's Bureau did do is it set up that black men could vote. And it also meant that there was the opportunity for black people now to have work um, to gain money and to improve their social standing and social status. Uh, but in addition to the 4 million um, slave population that was now free throughout the South in all the areas, there was also the free people who also identified as black and who were, most of them were doing well, not saying that they were you know, prosperous running around with land and plantations, but um, they were just also lumped in as part of the problem um, with the new uh, free black slave population. So the previous idea of, of the mammy, of uh, the noble slave, all of those had been perpetuated in order to say like, these are the people, you know, slaves were in every aspect of life, particularly in the South, but also in the North. Um, and so it was, Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel was like, you know, we say these people are part of our family, even though we own them, um, but they're not a threat to us, right? They're just trying to be the best people that they can do. That narrative does not work when you're afraid that this newly freed population, um, 4 million plus strong, um, all of a sudden will rise up and ultimately for a large section of the white American population, particularly in the South, it meant that with blacks being able to rise up, ultimately whites would fall down in status. So this led to Jim Crow. Um, so originally at this part, we were going to show a video of the um, Jim Crow Racist Memorabilia uh, Museum, but the images were very shocking and I've included a few here. Uh, so I'm going to wave now if you would like to not see them and I'll wave you um, back in or in type something in the chat. Uh, when I can find my chat. If Sam can type something in the chat when I get there. Okay, thank you. So the rise of Jim Crow in antebellum US. Um, the quote here that really stands out to me is the one from um, Dr. David Levering Lewis. And it's the African-American in antebellum times was as a stereotype held, reliable, faithful, hardworking, malleable. Indeed, one entrusted one's children, one's property to such people. Now, of a sudden, the African-American becomes demonized, a threat, a lascivious beast roaming the countryside of the South. People loosed by the end of slavery and now upon us like locusts. Well, this was an absurdity. And the absurdity he's referring to is the idea that people would all of a sudden see 
um, these black people that had been their slave, that had been raising them, that had been cooking for them for generations. Once again, the United States, uh, the United States had chattel slavery. So people would be born on, um, on a plantation, have children, their children would be born on a plantation. And unless they were sold away, they were there just as long as their white owners' families were. So how do you make these people now somebody to be feared so that basically white quote unquote greatness can be upheld? Um, so this started in the South because following the Civil War, the South lacked so um, a lot of financial stability because they were destroyed um, and everything was taken away from plantation owners. So you create a, a hate campaign. So Jim Crow um, lasted from 1865 and 1965. And when I say Jim Crow, I am talking about the Jim Crow laws of segregation. But it also should, should be noted that Jim Crow actually is a character. And that's the character that you're seeing right here. Jim Crow was the character of a white actor who the, the story goes that he saw a black slave who was creating songs and he liked the songs and he wrote them down, uh, performed it on as a show in blackface. It was a huge hit and he kept doing that eventually writing his own lyrics, but Jim Crow was his character. Um, this popularity of this character eventually read, led to full on minstrel shows that also continued into the 1960s. I mentioned this morning that if you're a fan of Julie Carlin um, or Mickey Work, you can actually see them doing menstrual shows in their early uh, black and white musicals when they're in their teenage years. Um, you also could see Fred Astaire um, doing blackface and doing a menstrual show in some of his films with uh, Ginger Rogers. So this was an accepted part of American culture. Nobody saw anything wrong with it. And it all started with this one man and his character. And it should be noted that this was in 1832, and it got more popular as um, Jim Crow, the national anti-black uh, propaganda campaign continued because the character um, was physically uh, disabled, once again, ableism, physically disabled, also black, he uh, didn't speak well. And so they were like, oh, this is a great way to show that this is what black people are. So these are more images of the national anti-black propaganda campaign, and when I say that this, these images and the stereotypes um, that Beecher Stowe saw as being quote unquote positive or, perpet or perpetuated in every aspect of American life. I do mean every aspect and whether we're talking about like on a clock that had a racist image, on a mug that had a racist image, um, desk, tables, um, anything, there was something that was basically saying black people were less and dehumanizing. Um, so a few things. This is a Sambo. And these are um, not only figurines, but they're also uh, salt shakers, um, paperweights. This was very common um, to see. These are um, postcards that you'll see around them with depictions of black children and black professionals. And then in the center, it's actually a racist coloring book. So children can learn racism like as young as possible. Uh, this is the mammy stereotype. So if you don't know who Aunt Jemima is or you didn't understand who I was referring to, you would recognize her from this, although they just officially changed um, the brand icon. I believe it was last week or maybe two weeks ago. Um, now, this has absolutely nothing to do with, uh, I mean, there's no reason for this to be racist at all. It's actually talking about a, a chicken place. Um, so the, the negative depiction of uh, Black people, no, um, also plays into another stereotype, though, with Black people and chicken. Uh, this is a mammy as depicted on washing powder. And then this I put in here to show how, how prevalent and how accepted that the stereotypes were. So while there were these general images uh, to dehumanize Black people to show uh, features as deformed, there are also certain personality types that were perpetuated. And while Black women were predominantly shown and as being overly sexual, uh, Black men were shown as being overly sexual, but also as being uh, unable to control their desires, and it was benevolent slavery that had kept them in check. 
And so this film, How Sleeps the Beast, excuse me, this uh, book from called How Sleeps the Beast is actually from the 1950s. Um, Jim Crow con continued to 1965. Both of my parents actually were born under it. Um, and in the corner, it says the man Negro, the girl white, the payoff lynch. And this idea of lynching being okay in an acceptable way ultimately to curb the black male was something that was pushed by a Jim Crow anti-black propaganda campaign. Um, prior to the Civil War and Reconstruction, if a white woman wanted to sleep with her black slave, it wasn't that it was something that was accepted or like smiled upon, but it was like, it's, it's her property, she can. Um, but after Jim Crow started, it became a, now we have to protect white women's virtue from the um, wild black men. Um, so this was best um, shown in the black brute stereotype. This is from 1899. It's the, the sheet of cover music, once again, no reason for this image to be here, but simply to perpetuate the idea of black people as less and of black men as violent smoking. You see the um, larger lips, the larger nose, the very dark skin. Um, this also fed into the I idea of, well, the impurity of the race, which led to lynch mobs, moral panic, but also uh, miscegenation um, laws and uh, ultimately led to the separate but equal separate but equal, excuse me, case. And so therefore it was codified by the federal government that separate but equal was indeed equal, which obviously it inherently is not. Um, and this is from 1864. And it was a warning that if uh, the North wins the Civil War, this is what you have to worry about. You know, white men and black, white women and black men being together and then what happens to uh, the white race. So, after all of this is going on, as though it's not enough, as though this propaganda is spreading from the South out into the nation, um, isn't enough anti-Blackness and isn't strong enough, then we run into a film. And once again, pop culture has always been pop powerful. And this is The Birth of a Nation. It's a 1950 film, 1915 film, excuse me. Um, that's about a white woman who is stalked by a black uh, recently free slave and how the Ku Klux Klan comes along and saves her. Obviously, they did not have a black actor. Um, the person you're seeing in the center of the Ku Klux Klan is a white actor in a uh, black face. So you're seeing this still from the movie on the right and then on the left, um, this is how it was advertised. The greatest picture of all time, the birth of a nation. Um, and this was not just in the South, this was a nationwide campaign and eventually international. So this is a poster um, talking about how it's coming to a theater in Texas. This is a poster um, talking about how it's um, going to be in a theater in uh, Philadelphia. Um, this is for Washington, D.C. And it's listing all the other places it's been seen. So New York, um, Chicago, once again, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and St. Louis. And then this is the film finally going to Australia. Um, if you're any at all familiar with Australia, you're aware of the fact that Australia does have an indigenous population. Um, and the argument for keeping Australia white was furthered by the Birth of the Nation film being shown there and justifying the treatment of the indigenous population of Australia. And finally, um, because it's America and because it was the greatest film ever made at the time, this is a clip of them announcing how President Woodrow Wilson had a private screening of The Birth of the Nation at the White House. Historically speaking, this is also the first private screening of a film or of a pop culture um, um, creation at the White House. So this was a big deal because of what it signified, but it also uh, was him endorsing the film. And indeed, after he watched it, he released a statement talking about how great it was and how important it was um, to the United States. So this film that's um, spreading from the South all the way through the nation, all the way to Australia, is taking with it the idea of the violent um, black male brute. Now in the context of 
excuse me, in the context of like culture, when you create a negative stereotype, at some point there's also going to be created like, well, what's the what's the exception? What's acceptable? Like who is acceptable outside of this group? And that's where we get into the changing stereotypes. So if you don't see, um, if white women didn't see black men as violent and animalistic, um, they would still see them as tall, dark, and other. So still potentially violent in, but now in a sexualized way that was enticing. So I put a few um, pictures of people of black men in Hollywood that I think are recognizable, just to give you the idea that while Hollywood has moved along um, from a birth of a nation, there's still a lack of awareness and representation um, when it comes to uh, black actors. So there's uh, Sidney Poitier on the complete uh, left, followed by Denzel Washington, Isaiah uh, Mustafa, who even when it's showing that even when black men are taking on comedic roles, there's still a necessity to be sexy and to be appealing. And then also uh, Luke Cage, Mike, Mike Coulter. And I'm not saying that these men aren't attractive, but there is a difference in viewing them as attractive and then the fact that Hollywood is only willing to see black men in a certain light. So where does that leave us? Um, after talking about all of this, after talking about uh, Bridgerton, which also falls into the same perpetuation of stereotypes, even though Simon is light-skinned, that's a whole different stereotype about how light-skinned men were possibly more feminine and also more recent. Um, rather, it leaves us with the Candyman. Um, yes. Did you want to do the other bit of history as well or leave it out? No, go ahead. Okay. I'm gonna just stop in my share. Yes, so before we get to Candyman, um, uh, just uh, quickly, uh, when we were talking about it, people are perhaps aware of this American context. I just wanted to put this, uh, well, we discussed it and sort of thinking about the UK context as well, just to trace some of those uh, similarities um, in kind of racial ideology, which we're finding cropping up in the UK as well. So um, there is a historical specificity to the situation that we find in America. Um, but we also have, um, you know, a British context as well, where we're seeing these same ideologies of race occurring, and it's worth sort of confronting those as well. So in the 20th century, uh, we're seeing different kind of socio-political and economic situations arising in England to the world of the 18th century. Um, after the First World War, um, there was uh, an influx of um, immigration, and there was also an economic downturn. And we have uh, the 1919 race riots, um, and when there were race riots um, in a number of UK cities, including uh, sort of most famously uh, Cardiff and Newport in Wales, um, Glasgow in Scotland and Liverpool in England. And you can see a picture there uh, for the racial riots at Cardiff. Um, uh, the Liverpool riots are perhaps the most well known because they um, resulted in significant uh, property damage with I think up to 700 people having to take refuge um, and in the lynching of uh, the black sailor uh, who was 24, Charles Wooten. Um, so you are getting these racial tensions and ideologies, particularly uh, connected at the time, as we can see in this newspaper cutting, um, firstly to sort of economic uh, concerns and economic downturns and this anti-immigration rhetoric that we're finding um, appearing, um, but also to this idea uh, of interracial relationships and you can see from the title of that newspaper cutting about uh, the Limehouse riot in London, that this emphasis is being placed on black men and white girls. Um, so if you're thinking about uh, race in England, uh, often people know about this and uh, sort of as a sort of changing point. Um, and uh, there is some discussion sometimes about this kind of as the point where black people came to England, which as we know is very much not true. Um, but in 1948, you have the British Nationality Act, which meant that any uh, sort of citizen of the uh, uh, British Empire, essentially, uh, the Commonwealth, uh, was a citizen of Britain. And you have um, a sort of great deal of immigration from the West Indies, um, particularly at this time, um, but then also later from uh, sort of India and Pakistan and other places within uh, the colonies, as they were at the time. Um, now, you have an invitation 
uh, to come and work because again you're looking at this in the aftermath of the second world war there is a lot to rebuild uh, there is a necessity for labor which is not able to be met because the population has been partly decimated in the uk and so you're getting these uh, sort of invitations to come and join and you're seeing this immigration most famously of course we have the windrush boat um and you're getting a sort of influx particularly west indian immigration um now as you can see from that uh, picture of the evening standard Although right from the beginning, uh, there was sort of a racial discourse around this and a sort of racist reactionary backlash, we are getting this sort of fairly optimistic depiction um, in some places as well. And you can see from the title, Welcome Home, the Evening Standard Plane greets the 400 sons of empire. This sense um, of belonging because of this sort of national need in, in a sense, but this quickly turns uh, into sort of increasing racial uh, tension. Uh, and sort of increasing uh, the widespread ideology, uh, racist ideologies. So uh, this is Lord Kitchener, who uh, came to England um, on the uh, Windrush, and he was a, a Calypso artist. Um, he's most famous, perhaps, for the clip that shown, uh, he just did an ad lib when he was coming off the boat of London is the place for me. But this is another song which I think points to some of the issues we've been picking up. Um, so uh, the song is, if, you, if you're not white, then you're considered black. So your father's an African, your mother may be Norwegian. You pass me, you wouldn't say goodnight, feeling you're really white. Your skin may be a little pink. And that's the reason why you think that the complexion of your face can hide you from the black race. No, you can never get away from the fact if you're not white, then you're considered black. Um, so there's two things going on here. He's pointing to a colorism, which was existing in the West Indian society that he had been used to. But then you're also seeing within this particular UK, uh, situation as it is now, you're getting this more binary conception of race. You've got white and not white as well. And that kind of uh, division uh, sort of reflecting, not legally, we didn't have a legal color bar in England, um, but re reflecting that sort of segregation mindset, uh, that segregationary kind of delineation that we're finding in America as well. Um, now I'll show a very brief clip. Um, this is an illustration from the time. It's an interview with somebody from the English Defense League. Um, the White Defence League, sorry. Um, uh, now, I would, this is highly disturbing. Uh, it's incredibly racist rhetoric. Um, I'm going to play only a very short clip and it's illustrative of the kind of arguments and rhetoric that were being used at the time. So things that Tanagra has been talking about in America, we can see very clearly also being reproduced in the UK context. Um, if you don't want to watch it, please do mute. Um, as I say, it's quite disturbing rhetoric very disturbing. One second. Against violence rather than for it. Well, what do you consider the dangers of an increasing coloured population? Well, there are many immediate evils of the coloured invasion which are well known to everybody living in this area. But in our opinion, the most important is the long-term one of mass interbreeding. We feel that you cannot have coloured immigration on the scale in which you're having it today without sooner or later having mass interbreeding. That must lead ultimately to a mulatto Britain. Insofar as we believe the civilization and culture of our country is the product of our race, we feel that if we have a mulatto population in the future, that must mean the downfall of the civilization and culture of our country, which we hold so dear. So um, you can hopefully hear that. Um, you can hear uh, very clearly this kind of particular fear of interracial relationships um, as kind of part of uh, the, a major part of the anti-black and racist rhetoric of the period. I'd also point out here the particularly perhaps British character of the, the expression of this racism, this kind of weaponized uh, politeness. Um, so sort of a slightly different kind of propaganda, but you have this very seemingly reasonable tone, uh, long words, a, a very sort of uh, measured construction of the argument, uh, reproducing these incredibly violent and vile uh, discourses. Uh, so just within this British context, moving uh, up to the period in which we're going to be finding Candyman, we're also seeing these uh, ideas as well, as Tanaga talked about, of that the, the sort of the brute idea or the connection of uh, black masculinity and criminality, um, particularly within the 60s and then into the 70s and 80s. And we have the resurrection and widespread use of the sus laws. So the sus laws actually date back to 1826, but effectively you could be arrested for looking suspicious. 
Um, and these were widely deployed against the black population um, in black majority areas such as Brixton. And we see this particularly in Operation Swamp in 1981, where these black areas were targeted um, by widespread uh, sort of deployment of the sus laws and stop and search. Um, and those eventually uh, led to the Brixton riots in 1981 as well. Um, the picture at the bottom is Linton Kwesi Johnson, and I put it here in case you're sort of interested in looking at the black response to these laws. Um, uh, if you find, uh, he was a dub poet, uh, he's dub poet and activist, and you can find a lot of his poetry on YouTube. If you look for Sonny's letter, that was his anti-sus uh, poem. Um, of course, you're kind of then, these sort of rhetorics are leading into these kind of violently racist um, discriminatory speeches and policies working their way into government. Um, you have, of course, 1968, the very famous Enoch Powell Rivers of Blood speech, which you can look up for yourselves um, if you wish to do so. I think it's quite famous and I think it's quite clear uh, what he's heading towards there in terms of the perceived threat of black immigration. In 1978, you have Margaret Thatcher, the, uh, the prime minister at the time, uh, using this sort of very similar to the man that we just saw, this rhetoric, this very reasonably sounding or reasonably constructed rhetoric to produce this image of black criminality and threat. Um, so you sort of disguising this uh, sort of very violent rhetoric to some extent. So we have the British character has done so much for democracy, for law, and done so much throughout the world that if there's any fear that it might be swamped, people are going to react and be rather hostile to those coming in. So this rather hostile, of course, is a minimization of uh, some of the sort of racialized violence and division that was occurring at the time. You also have this idea of the British character understood as the white British character as connected to democracy and law in contrast to the swamp, the swamping of Britain uh, by people of other races, particularly black men. Uh, so that is uh, the end of my section. Um, and over again to you, Tanagra, or did you want to use those pictures first? I can't remember how we did it this morning. By the way, if people have to leave, please do, but you're also very welcome to stay. We'll be going on for another hour, basically. Yeah. It's a complex topic. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, I'll just uh, go on to Candyman, because mm -hmm. um, you sort of gave me a perfect uh, segue. So... Um, so Candyman came out in um, 1992, and uh, Sam mentioned the, the demonization and criminalization of Black men as seen in the UK. Um, that, as I showed you with the anti-Black propaganda of, of Jim Crow era, was also happening in the US. Um, the Black brute uh, stereotype of Jim Crow um, today in modern media is um, viewed as also the black brute or the black bug stereotype. Um, and that's one that we see played out in Candyman. Um, if you're not familiar with Candyman, I'll uh, give you a rundown of the film. So Candyman is the story of Helen Lyle, the white woman on the left, and who's a graduate student who is writing her thesis on local legends and myths. She hears about the murder of a young female student that's attributed to this ghostly supernatural uh, creature called the Candyman. And she decides to investigate that legend um, that grew around this murder. So while she's doing all these interviews, she discovers that the root of the legend, it actually didn't start with the murder of this student, but rather um, in a Chicago housing project um, called Cabrini Green. So she and her research partner slash assistant slash the person didn't know how academia works on a higher level, um, Bernadette, who you're seeing on the right, uh, is, they decide to check out the origins of the story, but not before they decide to test the legend themselves. So the way it goes is that you stare in the mirror, you say his name five times, and then he appears. So they do this, and they head to Cabrini Green. Now, while she's doing this research about the legend at Cabrini Green, she actually discovers that um, the history of the Candyman goes even further back. In fact, it started in um, 1800s in the US. So once again, when I was talking about how it became an issue for, um, while there weren't actually miscegenation laws, 
um, there was this strong anti-Black sentiment for Black men to be with white women that started. Well, uh, Candyman is um, a victim of this in his past. So we're seeing the mural of Daniel Robitaille. I don't speak French, so I know I said that wrong, um, but it was either say it in bad English or uh, say it in Spanish. Um, and he's the son of a slave. Ultimately, his father works to free himself. Um, then he uh, continues to gain money and moves up the social ladder. And by the time Daniel is born, he's born as a freed man and he's educated. He has a excellent education and then it's discovered that he actually has a talent for art. And by the time he's a young man, he becomes an artist who's renowned for his portraiture. So a local landowner asks him to paint his daughter and in the process, they fall in love. Um, the daughter becomes pregnant. And um, if you do not like, uh, if you do not like to hear about violence happening to people, I will also once again say that this is a, a content warning. I um, mean, I'll ask Sam to just put in the chat when I'm done describing how he's killed, please. Um, okay, so um, once they find out that um, he's impregnated this young white woman, the men of the town and her father, in order to protect her honor and her uh, white purity and virginity, which obviously no longer exists because she's pregnant, but it's the idea of it, um, they take Daniel and they take him to the town square and they hold him down and they saw off his right hand. There's an apiary nearby. And so they take the honey from the hives, they smear it on his naked body after ripping his clothes off and they, um, he's stung to death by uh, the honeybees. As if that's not enough or not enough violence, they then burn his body and they scatter his ashes over what is the Cabrini Green area that Helen and her um, friend Bernadette go to look at for the legend of the candy man. So the idea being that he is part of Cabrini Green and therefore that is why he's in that location and that's his origins. So one thing that should be noted is that uh, she is a white woman. Um, this is Daniel's lover as she's depicted in Candyman. So while the story is disturbing enough, and there's also an element on top of it because Cabrini Green um, is actually one of the areas of a very, very large uh, Chicago housing project that while well, it, it no longer exists, but it did. At the time that Candyman was made in 1992, Cabrini Green was the housing project that was constantly in the national news. Um, one of the reasons, so one story that is not, doesn't happen at the Cabrini Green location, but rather happens in the same housing project. I believe um, Sam said housing projects are called counselor states um, in the UK. Um, so one of the things, sort of, okay, I'm trying to give cultural equivalents, <laughs> um, but so uh, Cabrini Green is um, a towers that are part of this very large uh, Chicago housing project. And when I mean large, I mean it housed like several thousand of people, several thousands of people. So you'll see on my screen, it's from Chicago Free Reader. And the title of it is, They Came In Through the Bathroom Mirror. Now, this story is actually about a woman called Ruthie Mae McCoy. And she lived in a different building that was, I believe, on the west side while Cabrini Green was on the north. And the article talks about how when she, because she was a paranoid schizophrenic and she was 52, when she called the police to report somebody trying to break into her apartment, she told them that they had thrown in the uh, medicine cabinet and they didn't um, believe her. And so nobody came out, even though her two of her neighbors called in and also said that they heard something and ultimately heard gunshots. The police came by to check on her, nobody responded, so they left. Um, then the day after that, because they didn't check on her until the day after she had called, the day after that, then one of her neighbors was like, I haven't heard from her, I haven't seen her. She was an older woman living alone. So the priest, police agreed to come back out um, they're like, okay, this is odd. They ultimately broke into her apartment and two days after she had actually come, um, called wanting help, they find her dead and shot five times. And they see that indeed um, they broke in through her, through her medicine cabinet. So you can see the image right here. Um, 
Cabrini Green and all of the towers at this housing complex. This was actually an issue in approximately uh, every four or six out of 10 apartments that the apartment on the other side could push through. And Ruthie actually had been robbed previously by um, people doing this. And when she called to report it, they never fixed it. And it ultimately led to her untimely death. So this story is taken and becomes the basis of how the Candyman, um, the Candyman's first murder in the Cabrini Green of the film. Um, there is a lot of uh, white savior elements going on in this, not necessarily because the story is taken, but because the creative who wrote the story, one is a white male, but then on top of that, he also decided that he wanted to make the person doing this research, Helen, a white woman. Um, and then outside of the story, he also thought it was very important to shoot at the location that this happened at. So on the left, you're seeing the hallway and at the, the, uh, the apartment at the end is actually uh, Ruthie May's apartment where she was murdered. And um, on the right, you're seeing a shot of the actual Cabrini Green. The buildings were very similar because they were part of the same housing complex. Um, So uh, where does this leave us when we're talking about the romance and the white power structures that come to play both in the film and the romance, but then also um, in the bigger picture of the context? A good question. <laughs> Is it time for me to share my screen again? Clips and so on and so forth. Yes, okay. Hi guys, it's me again, sharing my screen. Um, so one of the things that we picked out um, is the sort of genuine of the text and how it creates a white savior narrative, particularly in in this sort of uh, as part of this relationship. So Helen um, is, as we'll see, effectively it, there's a seductive element to her relationship with the Candyman, um, but at the end she crawls away from him, refuses to die with him, um, saves the baby that you can see in this picture. Um, and then this is her funeral and you have the entire congregation as the Candyman refers to it of Cabrini Green coming to her funeral. And then you also have this kind of white saviouriness really underlined um, in the mural. Uh, so Tingagra already showed you uh, the mural of his story and his fate. And here we have the mural of Helen. I've taken the sort of slightly further away view rather than the closer in one, um, just so that you can see the setup of this as a sort of altar and church and her as a kind of beatified figure that we see here. So she's very uh, overtly being portrayed as a savior, very overtly being portrayed as a white savior. And within that relationship uh, between the two of them as well, uh, she sort of, uh, as we'll discuss in a little bit more in a second, um, her sort of refusal to be in that relationship uh, transforms her into a savior and erases him and his power um, in the area. Um, did you want to add anything before we look at the clips, Tanagra? Uh, no, I think the only thing that I would probably add is that it should be noted that um, Helen does go looking for the Candyman and he responds. Um, there's not a situation where he's chasing after her. She ultimately is the person who um, instigates this, in, this entire, entire relationship um, and all of the tragedy that follows. Yes. Definitely. Something to bear in mind when we see these scenes just now. Hopefully it will actually play on my screen, but we will see. It might just uh, work as a link. So wait a second. Okay. Oh, so this is the first scene in which uh, the Candyman or Daniel appears to Helen. Helen plays into it and perpetuates it. And then it also brings it, it also sort of double down, double downs on, doubles down, Lord, excuse me, um, on this idea of the black brute and is a callback to its own problematic um, stereotype 
in the figure of the Candyman because he is um, because he is monstrous. Um, and one thing that's to be noted is that uh, Tony Todd was cast because uh, they saw him, Clive Barker and Bernard Rose, and the other option was Eddie Murphy. They cast Tony Todd because he was um, dark, tall, and intimidating. Um, so failing to uh, look at their own white privilege and racism um, while also trying to comment on the fact um, that Helen is going into this neighborhood that she doesn't really belong in, which was supposed to be part of the narrative, but gets completely lost in the idea of the white savior and simply perpetuates um, negative stereotypes about uh, black people, so. Yeah, <laughs> oh dear. We will be quite mean to both films so far, but not unjustifiably so. Um, but no, I think they were trying, but um, I think you this also have to know what you don't know. Say again. This one was trying. I don't think Bridgerton tried. <laughs> no, Bridgerton, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I agree. Um, I agree. Um, so do people have some uh, questions about this one, about this discussion as well? thoughts that you have been saving up uh not a question but a quick book recommendation that in leela taylor's darkly black history in america's gothic soul she has a solid portion about Candyman and reading it as a gothic text and especially about like the architecture and geography um of it and it is pretty interesting. But yeah, I had not actually watched that film before, but I think I'm gonna have to watch it after hearing both her and you talk about it. Yeah, uh, second time I've seen that book in two weeks, so I definitely need to read it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, Maisha's talk as well looked at Candyman and I thought like that sort of, I think her concentration on camera work is really interesting and you could go into a whole dissection of what the camera is doing in terms of representing uh, sort of their relationship and, uh, you know, cross currents of identification and stuff in different scenes. And uh, also the, uh, what was, what's the term? For, <laughs> For um, you know, you, you have this kind of, uh, focusing in so often on Helen's face so you have this prioritization of her emotional mm -hmm. response um, not yes. only in her own situation but also to his story quite often so it becomes sort of appropriated that's the word yeah very, very much so which sort of actually makes sense though because in the at the end of the film that's exactly what's happened uh, when you look into the when you look into the mirror now you say her name not his name and she shows up with the hook not him so it, it works, but once again, in a way that I don't necessarily think they were aiming for it to. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think I, I had a thought that um, doesn't necessarily super tie in right at this moment, but I'm going to try and make it tie in. Um, so the idea of, you know, she comes back as an agent of revenge and it's very directed. And I think that that's kind of uh, sort of part of the problem and the comparison. But I was thinking when you were talking to Nag about these kind of narratives of uh, of blackness and brutality or of violence or fear that this is such a common aspect of 17th 18th and 19th century abolitionary narratives or narratives which seem to be um abolitionary or sympathetic to uh at the abolitionary cause etc that you have this depiction of the brutalization of uh often black male bodies um, within something like Orinoco by Afro Bend, which isn't a pro-abolitionary text, but it is this kind of uh, um, text which uh, depicts positively, broadly speaking, the, the main character Orinoco, and you have the the emphasis on, you know, the brutalization of him, of, of what happens to him, the brutality of what happens to him, but you also have this back note of the fear of retaliation and the fear of violence, which, so this is, um, you know, it's a common feature of texts that are trying to engage productively right. with race because of that unwillingness to confront the kind of the own biases, fears and sort of 
uh, uh, epistemologies that they are bringing to the text. So they're bringing yeah. to the fiction. Yeah. yeah. That's, I mean, that's both a really um, awesome point in comparison, but also just shows there's a lot more work to be done, um, both in the creative and social uh, arena as far as racism goes. So, yeah. Um, I think it's an interesting thing, you know, where we're seeing all of these ties and we'll see them the last bit in sort of get out, which is bringing it up to the current day, but we're seeing all of these repeated discourses and dialogues and, and trends in these kind of historical periods that, um, you know, interesting yeah. ties all yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, does anyone have another question before we go on to the last bit? Do you feel free? I know there's a lot of talkings. Um, okay. It's over to you again, Tanagra, for get out. All right. Um, so 